Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Khaldun Nazari, I'm president, and I have the honor to moderate this event today. Uh, our guest speakers uh, are experts in the energy field, especially alternative and renewable energies. And our talk today will focus on this sector. Let me introduce uh, our guest uh, at the very right, Mr. Mark Anderson. He's a Japan, uh, uh, Japan country head of independent power producer pattern development, Japan, and also an executive of Green Power Investments, KK Tokyo. And to his left is Mr. Uh, Mr. Sachio Ehara. He is the director of the Institute for Geothermal Information and professor emeritus at Kyushu University. He has served as director of the International Geothermal Geothermal Association and president of Geothermal Research Society of Japan, and he also had positions at the Ministry of uh, Economy, Trade and Industry in Tokyo. And to my very right is Mr. At Tetsunari, Tetsunari Ida, and he is executive director of the Institute for uh, for Sustainable Energy Policies, ISEP. He is a leading authority in the renewable energy and the social, social uh, innovation, and uh, he also uh, has a lot of uh, extensive research and studies in this field. Uh, he's in, in uh, organizes organization is non-profit organization and independent and today uh, each speaker will speak about less than 10 minutes and that will be followed by uh, questions and answers uh, without further ado ladies and gentlemen please welcome our guest speaker thank you okay. can i start yes okay so uh, I'm our, uh, thank you for chairperson. Uh, I'm our Ted Zida from our Institute for Sustainable Energy Policies. And today I talk about uh, the renewable market uh, trends in Japan, uh, overall and more focus on the solar PV. And the, I, I deliver the, my materials of the presentation and also uh, the, the data of the, the the snapshot of the Japanese renewable energy uh, status, uh, so you can defer those uh, materials. And the and uh, uh, this year, six years after Fukushima disaster, and also uh, two years after Paris Agreement. And the the I'm not in a, my presentation of the global trend of the renewable energy, especially solar and wind. Uh, currently, e so-called explosive growth, and more and more solar and, and wind uh, come up with. Um, the, so you can you can see that you uh, the data in our papers. And the, so uh, the two years before the wind power capacity surpassed nuclear, and the and and also uh, wind and solar is the currently the cheapest electricity source uh, globally, uh, not in Japan, but the, uh, among all other powers. So, uh, but uh, Japan is, uh, uh, today's my talk is, uh, the essence is a sharp increase of new linear power. Uh, it's, uh, we have uh, successfully introducing feed in tariff law after, right after the Fukushima disaster. And, but this is the solar PV is very much dominant, 95 percent, and the, while other renewables and the wind and geothermal and others are still are coming right. And the and but still uh, right now we have facing a so-called political grid constraint. Uh, this is going to shut down the door for a new market. And solar PV has become more popular investment product with some troubles, and I, I will show some product, some materials. Uh, the last, uh, the before Fukushima disaster, the renewable uh, nuclear supply in 25 percent, and renewable mostly large hydro, 
uh, supply is almost 10 percent but uh, nuclear is now almost zero but uh, uh, renewable increasing uh, almost five points the 2016 we have already more than fi uh, 15 percent so plus five point is uh, thanks for the feed and tariff uh, but this is the mostly the solar PV 95 percent and wind power two percent and hydro is uh, small hydro actually this is uh, one percent increase and biomass is two percent share of the new renewables and geothermal is zero point something <laughs> it's very small so uh, this is mostly coming from our last four years especially 2013 14 15 uh, oh, and 2016 is uh, as of uh, 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 December 2016, so uh, fiscal year of 2016 is a little more than uh, eight, 8 gigawatts, so um, almost last four years was uh, a kind of boom, bust of the boom, booming of the solar PV. And the, but uh, be mostly because of this solar, the booming, the the September of 2014, the the Kyushu electric powers uh, the claims to uh, they are uh, ten, ten, tentatively stop to new application of the grid connection. Then following other uh, electric monopoly, uh, they introducing with uh, our government introducing a kind of po political so-called good constraint since uh, 2015. So new market uh, is now uh, very much constrained, mostly because of uh, the, the grid. For example, the, the Tohoku areas, the north of Japan uh, last year, uh, sorry, this is a so-called Heisei. This is a, uh, the left hand side is uh, last year, April. Uh, and the one month after last year, uh, May, the all the north part of the the Tohoku areas are the completely shut down for new application of the the renewable energy, and the and also this is uh, the focus on the solar PV, and the along with uh, this is uh, the governmental uh, the approved the capacity of solar PV. And the first fiscal years after introduction of feed type uh, 2012, the about 20 gigawatt of solar PV was approved. Then following fiscal year 2013, the additional 50 gigawatt were uh, approved. And the following years, uh, 10 gigawatt approved. So in total, 80 gigawatt of solar PV was approved uh, for the first three years. And this is uh, almost total in so far the approved capacity of solar PV. And the 35 gigawatt already built and 28 gigawatt uh, invalidate this uh, March end. So the, the rest, a uh, little less than 20 gigawatt were still uh, under construction or under investigation to how to achieve. So this is the, the contents of the so-called uh, the booming of the solar PV. And also new phenomenon is now solar PV is the invested or traded uh, like just as if the land, land investment, so or property investment. So we have so many internet sites to the solar PV investment site. So if you can see that this can uh, or Google, so you can you can in, you can invest through the internet even. But most of them are very much the troublesome project. So so this is uh, a kind of the strange phenomenon so also other new new things is uh, so-called solar sharing this is also job solar sharing with farming the sharing the land sharing the light with the farming this is a uh, the three 
former prime minister Koizumi, former prime minister the Hosokawa, former prime minister Khan are all toge together the celebrating the new solar sharing and the PV project uh, celebrating this uh, April. Uh, this is one of the Japanese the uniqueness uh, project actually, and uh, Japan is actually uh, the relatively still expensive. The renewable price, uh, the solar wind, uh, all the renewables compared to uh, the global standard. But even though the solar PV uh, feed and tariff price are getting. Uh, more cheaper and cheaper, and the last five years, almost uh, half of the price is uh, less than the electricity price. So even the industry can install the solar PV, can uh, eliminate the electricity price uh, into installing the solar. This is uh, potentially the, uh, the except of the grid issue or except of the solar PV. Uh, feeding type, uh, the potentially the more self-consumption market can be the more expansions. And also the new phenomenon is uh, so-called arising community power. The, the people are very much mobilized after Fukushima disasters. And some of the people are working their own community powers. Uh, right now, uh, 200 community powers come up with last five years. And the uh, the so solar and wind are shared by the communities. Uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, one of the interesting phenomena. Um, and then uh, back to the solar PV market. Uh, so uh, we have now the passing the s the booming and vast process of the solar PV market. But uh, this small distributed market come up with uh, the the coming few years. So, so this is uh, one of the the new the potential of the market in Japan uh, because of the the people are more and more mobilized to energy to uh, self consumptions or the community powers and more for people together. So yeah, that's it. So. So that is uh, some overall snapshot on the solar PV market trends. Thank you. Yes. 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 Yeah, right. uh, how do you get the full view? Hi. Um, my name is uh, Mark Anderson. Um, really have very little time today, but I wanted to give you a brief introduction of who I am, who I work for. Um, I uh, um, was originally hired by uh, Pattern Energy about three years ago. Pattern Energy is a, a uh, uh, we have two groups in our company. We have a private developer group and then we have a publicly listed vehicle uh, in the United States and, and Canada. It's roughly a, a two billion uh, market cap company. Um, we do both uh, wind and solar, um, but in addition, particularly outside Japan, we would love to inside Japan, but we do transmission projects as well outside of Japan. We're active in the United States, Canada, Chile, uh, Japan, and, and Mexico. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I came here three years ago uh, to start uh, the business for, for Pattern Energy. Prior to that, um, I was with a, a, a Japanese renewables company for about 13 years running their business in the, United, in, uh, the Americas, so the US and South America. America. Oops, oh no, I don't. Um, Pattern Energy has uh, about two, 2.7 gigawatts of, of owned assets uh, um, in the Americas and, and, and South America. I think we manage another close to a, uh, another gigawatt. Um, 
and uh, the, these these uh, pages are taken directly out of our uh, uh, our listed vehicles uh, website. Um, so if you want to get more information on on Pattern Energy, it's uh, patternenergy.com for our listed vehicle, and Pattern Dev P A T T E R N D E V dot com for our private vehicle. Um, on the private side, we have a group of people that have, have uh, um, built and installed over five gigawatts of, of renewable energy. Uh, many of us have been together, either directly together or uh, uh, working on projects together for more than 15 years. Um, um, when we came to Japan three years ago, it was just me um, in a very small office. Um, we were intending on making investments in either solar or, or uh, wind projects, um, and we were particularly interested in the, the feed-in tariff program in Japan. And why we thought we could be competitive here or actually help here is, is because we have a long history of, of, of wind power, um, solar, and transmission. Um, in the United States and the Americas. And we felt one of the things that was missing in Japan was uh, an operator that was a large operator. Um, we buy hundreds of millions of dollars worth of wind turbines every year. So we were, were confident that we could bring international price. And one of the issues in Japan has always been the cost of, of doing anything here. Um, so we were confident, particularly in one area, that we knew we could bring our our uh, uh, economies of scale and our, our buying power um, that we have in the Americas to Japan and make sure that we are getting pricing here in Japan that was as, as good as anywhere outside of, of Japan. Um, uh, within about six months, uh, uh, we ended up acquiring uh, a controlling stake in a company called Green Power uh, Investment Corporation. It had been around since about 2006, started by uh, a founder by the name of Hori Toshio, who's a, a fairly, or I guess a, a, a well-known person in Japan as a pioneer of, of, of wind energy, who did some of the very first, or did the first large project in Japan, also did one of the very first projects, surprisingly, a Japanese uh, uh, trading house did the first uh, large-scale wind power project in the U.S. in about 1987, 89. about 150 megawatts. It was the largest in the world for many, many years. Um, then went on to do projects in, in Europe and then back in Japan again uh, um, to take the business forward. So we're working very closely with our, our partners here um, and uh, um, uh, have uh, developed a, a significant pipeline of projects, primarily wind projects, but we're also doing solar. Um, as you see here, we've got, uh, um, <clears throat> I think, a total of about 616 megawatts of operational assets. We don't own all of those. We own uh, uh, a part of those. Some of those we manage for, for other people. Um, but the rest of the projects are all projects that, that uh, we've developed and, and will own in the future ourselves. Um, we have a 33 megawatt wind project in Shikoku that's under construction now. Um, in addition to that, we have another 826 megawatts of uh, uh, feed-in tariff approved projects. Um, of those, uh, let's see, I think 126, we have about 220 or 250 that have confirmed access to the grid. And this is one of the issues um, that Edison raised, raised earlier, is just access to the grid is one of the, the obstacles that we have in front of us here. But as you see here, we've got a significant pipeline of projects that over the next 10 years, we feel we can build out at least 1,000 megawatts, um, which will add significantly to uh, the current wind uh, uh, existing capacity in, in Japan. Um, this last page is really the page I wanted to focus on, on most, and I feel is most, most, uh, most inter interest. The Japanese government here has done a great job in kickstarting renewable energy with the feed-in tariff program, uh, about which uh, many of you uh, uh, are fully aware. Um, but one of the issues that, that we faced here is, is that there were some unintended consequences with uh, the support, the feed-in tariff program uh, uh, for renewable energy in Japan. And that was just the, the ease of, of permitting, or the, the lack of of permitting requirements in many instances for solar projects in Japan. So very, very quickly, um, I think there was a total of, uh, say here, over 80 gigawatts of solar projects that were approved with feed-in tariffs. And that started at 40 yen uh, per kilowatt hour, and then I think has gone down slowly over time to 24, and now it's in the auction process. But um, that has actually clogged up the system. Um, and keep in mind that 80 gigawatts of, of solar projects is close to 300 and 
20 billion dollars worth of projects. This is just an extraordinary, um, Japan costs are high, so it'd be higher than, than anywhere else in the world, but, but regardless, just an extraordinary amount of feed-in tariff approved projects. The government, the METI, has been working on, on trying to declog the system, um, and uh, they have made some progress in that. But what it has done is all these projects that had feed-in tariff approvals then applied for interconnection and uh, um, there's a question as to whether or not there's still remaining capacity on it or not, but regardless, having 80 gigawatts of projects in the queue for interconnection has slowed down some of the other projects and, and triggered some uh, uh, obstacles to actually getting access for newer uh, geothermal, uh, wind, and, and, uh, um, and biomass projects. So where will it go from here in Japan? Um, the good things, um, tariff certainty. Um, so we've got a revenue profile that we can we can rely on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, solar has gone to an auction system, so uh, um, less certainty for for solar projects today. Um, another thing that Japan did was to, to they amended some laws uh, that allowed uh, uh, projects to get built on uh, Class One agricultural lands. Um, and uh, certain national forests and, and things in those areas. So that's opened up the, the country to uh, having more, uh, uh, particularly wind power projects in those areas. So that's been a, a very good thing. And clearly the, the, the Japanese government's support for the Paris Agreement is a, is a big driver for uh, renewable energy here. Um, so what are the minuses, um, the obstacles that we face? Uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the energy mix that the, the Japanese government has an announced uh, from a, a renewable energy developer, owner, operator perspective is, is quite low. I think they're, they're targeting 22 to 24 percent by 2030 uh, for renewable energy. That includes large hydro. So I think large hydro is around 9 percent. Um, so uh, um, it's not a, a significant growth. There could be significantly more growth, in other, other words. I think currently there's about 5% uh, non-hydro renewables uh, in operation in Japan. But one of the biggest issues in Japan that, that, that's a conundrum for the government is, is the difficulty with the utilities. Uh, the, 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 the renewable energy program in Japan was not set out, so it, it incentivized the utilities to cooperate and participate. Um, I'm not being critical of the utilities. They, they've got their own set of issues that tr they're trying to work through, financial issues. Um, deregulation is going on, so they're losing some of their their monopoly power. So um, it, it's, it's natural that they're not want, going to want to be super cooperative. Um, but that was one area where, you know, somehow we need to find a way so we either give comfort to the utilities in knowing what their future is about um, and whether or not they've got financial stability in the future or not. Um, that's an important factor. So many of these new challenges that are being posed to the utilities about grid operation, um, about sending uh, electricity from uh, Hokkaido to Tohoku or Tohoku to uh, TEPCO, all those are issues that could open up the grid substantially and increase uh, uh, capacity available for new, new renewables. Um, the other issue is just the, all the, the grid islands. Japan is a, is a set of islands, and then on top of that, within those islands, you've got very small islands of electrical grids, and they don't talk to each other very much. Um, they don't interact very well. That's one area that needs to be significantly improved in Japan. Steps are being made towards fixing that. Um, the introduction of the independent uh, grid system operator called OCTO um, was a big step forward. However, it doesn't have a lot of authority and teeth. Um, so uh, um, they can make rest recommendations, but there haven't been, uh, uh, again, they have a difficulty in enforcing. Um, and also the people from Octo have, have you know, the experts in, in electricity in Japan are all uh, utility people. So uh, um, that's one area that, that still needs to, to be substantially improved in Japan. I think it's coming, um, but that is one area, just grid optimization, effective utilization of what, you, what we already have here today. A very stable grid, um, just not a very flexible grid. Um, the one of the other issues that has come up recently, I have a couple more minutes, two more minutes, is the institution of, of under the feed-in tariff program, um, there was a policy set out just recently that allows the utilities to curtail uh, renewable energy when supply exceeds demand. Um, now, this is something that, it's, it's, it's a complex issue, um, 
but if you think that Japan is currently surviving, you know, surviving is, is, is the lights are on, um, everything is good without uh, uh, the complete nuclear uh, uh, set of uh, facilities up and running again, um, that means that there should be excess supply. Um, another potentially 45 gigawatts worth if all the nuclear came back on. It's a rough figure. Um, so anyway, this is an issue that, that we're used to dealing with in the United States um, and, and outside, but here in Japan it's difficult for us to forecast when supply would exceed demand and then exactly when we would be curtailed, what would the merit order, who would be curtailed first. They have some programs in place, but they're not particularly very clear. Um, so it's a, it's a black box as to how the grid is actually operated and when one uh, generation facility is run um, or given priority over another one. Um, and the last point is there's, there is latent demand for renewable ener energy in Japan. I think the consumers want more, would like to, you know, people, my friends um, would like to see more renewable energy. They would like to be able to purchase renewable energy. The major technology companies in the U.S. were able to sell directly through a variety of contractual means to the Googles, the Amazons of the world. And, uh, um, I'm very confident here in Japan they would love to be uh, doing the same thing here and ensuring that the, uh, the electricity that they use uh, either directly in their manufacturing facilities or through their suppliers, they'd also like to be covering that with uh, renewable energy. Um, so that's a, a driver for uh, uh, renewable energy. It's kind of missing in Japan. Um, in the U.S., they quite often have an RPS system, which means the utilities are required to buy a certain percentage. Um, that may be coming in Japan with the non-fossil trading uh, market that they're considering. Um, but the last point I want to make is, uh, um, you know, in the U.S. and many places in the world, renewable energy has become a win-win-win. It's uh, win, win on emissions. It's uh, win on uh, energy independence. And it's win on pricing. Um, in Japan, we're not quite there on pricing. We're getting close. But certainly in Japan, there are two wins out of those threes, and that's on emissions and uh, on energy independence. And certainly with things happening in the world today with Qatar and others, um, energy independence should, should have some value. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sachio Ehara. Uh, uh, in Japan, we have many active volcanoes. Therefore, we have huge geothermal potential. But uh, we have a small number of uh, geothermal plants. That is a problem. And the title of my talk is Present and the Future of Geothermal Energy Utilization in Japan. Uh, yeah, uh, this slide shows a recent trends of geothermal power generation in the world or in Japan and in Japan. Uh, world trends makes uh, uh, progress, uh, but. Japan grows uh, stagnant uh, in recent 20 years. You can see of green colors. And uh, uh, in Japan, we have huge geothermal potentials over uh, 20,000 megawatt, but uh, limited actual power generation about uh, 500 megawatt. Uh, it means we have uh, barriers. Uh, now in Japan, we have three major barriers. 
The first one is power generation cost issue. At present, we have no power generation cost issue, basically, uh, because uh, we have a feed-in tariff system. And the second is a national park issue. Uh, over 80% of promising resources are situated inside the national park special areas. Uh, the third is hot spring issue, uh, concerns over negative impacts on surrounding hot springs. Uh, here, uh, two and three will be discussed. Uh, the first one is national park issue. As I mentioned before, over 80% of promising resources are uh, situated inside the special areas. Uh, therefore, uh, they have been unable to use since 1972. But uh, recently, uh, the regulations began to take place as below. We have several uh, the uh, regulations. Uh, for example, recently notified in fall 2015, uh, directional drilling of underground within the type one special uh, areas was allowed. Um, anyway, uh, recently you have several uh, uh, the regulations, but uh, not enough. Uh, we need more the regulations. Uh, another one uh, issue is hot spring issue. Uh, we have no negative impacts of geothermal power generation on hot springs seen from actual data in Japan. Uh, in case of Japan, uh, there is no scientific explanation that geothermal power generation has a negative Im impact uh, on hot springs uh, such as depletion and so on through 50 years of geothermal power generation experience. Then we have verified uh, sustainable production of geothermal fluid without negative impacts on hot springs. We expect scientific understandings to hot spring officials. In other countries, uh, New Zealand, Wairake, and uh, the Philippines, uh, Tiwi, uh, decreased activities of hot springs and uh, geysers. And in some air cases, hydro hydrothermal explosions occurred. And the reason of such negative impacts, uh, excessive uh, production of geothermal fluid and release of unnecessary hot water into rivers and the ocean without underground injection. Then uh, depletion of geothermal fluid occurred. Uh, here, summary of geothermal power generations impact on hot springs. Uh, first, uh, if improper production of geothermal fluid is done, for example, excessive fluid is produced and the injection is not allowed. It not only affects hot springs, but also exert major impacts uh, on its own power generation. Second, to avoid exerting negative impacts, it is important to review and apply measures scientifically and technically. Of all factors involved, sustainable production is crucial, which is technically possible. And to balance the amount of fluid produced and the amount of fluid replenished is essential. Uh, here, uh, I'll show you a good uh, example. Uh, uh, this slide shows the uh, Japanese largest Jusan power plant. Uh, uh, capacity is 112 megawatt. Uh, Hachobar Jusan power plant um, 
大分プロジェクトは九州。We have here, we have 40 years stable production without a、uh, negative impact on hot springs.、Uh, you can see a、uh, power plant and、uh, around、uh, here、uh, we have many、uh, hot springs, but no negative impact on hot springs. Uh, this is a, a final slide. Geothermal power generation's immediate goals in Japan. First, the goal is to increase power generation by 1500 megawatts,、uh, three times as much as the present, until 2030,、uh, which is 1%. Just 1% of share in Japan and is equivalent to、uh, 10,000 megawatt of solar power generation. Then, if so, we could draw a roadmap for 2050 to 2100. How much can we achieve? For example, around 10%. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights. We open the floor at your questions.、Uh, please start. Süddeutsche Zeitung Night had two questions to Mr. Ehara.、Um, first, you said present and future of、uh, geothermal. Now, Japan, of course, was the geothermal pioneer in the world. And in the 1970s and 1980s,、uh, that was the future. And then our dear friends from the utilities and from the government、uh, stopped. Uh, geothermal. Can you tell us? I don't know the exact story how they stopped geothermal in Akita University, for example. So that's my first question. My second question is that、um, I was in Hachobaru last year, and、uh, there we discussed in, in solar and in wind, especially in solar and in, in water, hydro, too, you have these smaller and smaller, like a village that has this, its little、uh, hydropower plant. And then there, the experts were not sure if small scale geothermal has a future too. Yes,、uh, and the answer to the first question is uh, 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 main reason is a, a policy of government. The government selected nuclear, then they、uh, did not want to increase geothermal. And、uh, another one is uh, uh, regarding Kyushu.、Uh, yes, and、uh, in Kyushu,、uh, we have also uh, uh, we have many uh, active volcanoes and also、uh, active geothermal field. And we have a big potential. And uh, uh, for example, Kyushu Electric Company wants to uh, larger. Uh, plant and they are and now investigating. And uh, uh, yes, in the near future, we have many larger geothermal power plants in Kyushu, also in Tohoku and in Hokkaido. But my、okay. question was do you have a small scale, like、uh, uh, for 10 houses, like somewhere、uh, you have on one house?、Uh, uh, Can you have small scale geothermal? <laughs> yes. I know, Uh, in Japan, we have a small and intermediate and large plant. s And uh, 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 for small plant, s the leading time is very small, and also fit price is very high. Then,、uh, and it is easy to、uh, make a small plant. Plants,、uh, but I know,、uh, uh, uh, the target for our uh, government is uh, uh, until 2030 uh, by, uh, by 1500 megawatt. Uh, we, we must uh, uh, make uh, three times 
then the, I think uh, uh, small plant is uh, all right, but uh, uh, we must, uh, our target is very big, and we must make a, a larger uh, geothermal plant, okay? I, I'm just following uh, the, uh, there, there are some small project, uh, so-called a binary cycle. It's a very so small, and also uh, it's a using uh, uh, kind of already the, uh, the come up with the higher temperatures, hot spa. So they are more more harmonized with the hot spa peoples. So, but the, 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 those are very small, uh, or less than one megawatt or something, uh, several hundred kilowatts. But they are one of the potential to. Uh, uh, spread out of the geothermal as a, with harmonizing with the hot spot people. And also the, the fa first question, uh, another aspect of the, the, elect the former the project scheme was uh, the developing the geothermal resource by the big industry like uh, Mitsubishi or Idemitsu. And then uh, electricity utilities buying the, ge buying the steam from them as uh, as a uh, so called uh, the the fixed price then uh as you see the utilities are using uh, those resources as a cheaper electricity but those big industry has now or uh, has not uh, good strengths they are more uh, not enough money or not investment uh, the very risky money risky business to the digging out and also, field and tariff not uh, not allowed to uh, electricity utility themselves to the, the the produce electricity. So, so those old days, all the good days, project scheme was now destroyed, and no no new no new uh, like a new scheme are not yet developed. So it's a now last two decades was uh, kind of the a very difficult time to for developing geothermal in Japan. Yes, uh, we, we have a new idea for development of larger geothermal plants. Yes, thank you. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> My name is Kurt Sieber. I'm an associate member, but I'm heavily invested in L in electricity. Um, I have two questions. The first one, I mean, we were talking about the grid and all the political aspects and so on, and I think that situation is different from country to country. On the other hand, my question goes to the um, storage of electricity, which is another uh, big uh, reason why um, there are restrictions and limitations uh, to the uh, use of uh, <coughs> of uh, renewables uh, uh, too much too much uh, when the sun and uh, is shining and the wind is blowing when i was in europe uh, recently we had cases where already um, electricity was traded at minus rates and in fact, that is even going up. Um, so uh, the, how do you see the future of the um, storage? And with a specific question, um, do you see any chances for hydrogen to become uh, one of the pillars of uh, the storage uh, facilities? Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, whoever feels uh, <laughs> can, can uh, okay. I'll, I'll be happy yeah. to start. So, Mr. Uh, Anderson, please. Sure, yeah. thank yeah. you. Um, it's a very good question. I think, first of all, Japan is nowhere near that point where they uh, need uh, storage, where they have excess uh, uh, capacity, excess solar during the daytime. It's certainly becoming a, a very serious issue in the state of California. It will become an issue in, in Texas. And I'm, I'm not as familiar in, in Europe, but there's a, a famous chart that everybody talks about in the US called the duck curve. And uh, the duck curve is a net load uh, 
uh, graph. Um, and it basically shows net load dropping to almost negative rates uh, uh, during the middle of the day. Um, and that's because there's an excess supply of solar, um, particularly in California and, and other areas. Um, storage is very interesting. Um, one of the things that Japan does have, Japan has the largest pumped hydro storage capacity of any country in the world. I think they have 27 gigawatts. Um, that was originally built to accommodate the, 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 the nuclear facility so they can continue to run at nighttime when, when, when demand drops. Um, but right now, as you can imagine, um, they're not being used very much. Um, so certainly that is one area that uh, uh, if, if well managed uh, um, certainly could be a source of, of storage for the intermittent renewable energy sources uh, in, in Japan. As to hydrogen, um, we're certainly looking at it. Um, it it's uh, uh, a lot uh, more difficult to, to transport. It's not as easy as electricity. If you storage and you put it back on the store and you put it back on the system very easily, um, hydrogen is, is a little more difficult. But certainly, um, we are looking at it on a, a couple of projects. Um, economically, it doesn't seem like it makes sense yet. Economically, yeah. financially, it does not seem to uh, a battery storage would be more economically efficient than 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 uh, uh, than hydrogen today. But again, there's some strategic reasons for the government to say in certain areas we'd like to see some hydrogen storage. So, yeah, just one following the uh, most important things the are. Uh, kind of Japanese the electricity war. The grid operator should change the paradigm the from base load idea to more flexibility idea. And we need more open market and uh, much more than important of the o open market rather than the, the storage. We already have, a, uh, as Mark told, uh, the, the 27 gigawatt the pump hydro. This is a huge huge uh, storage already we have. But we need open market and the idea of flexibility. And last last May May 4th, uh, actually one year before, in Kyushu and Shikoku has a COP with uh, almost 80% of renewables. Uh, that because May 4th is a golden week in Japan, is a, the bottom of the, the, the demand and very high solar demand. So 80% were supplied of by renewables. And Kyushu cope that demand by pumping hydro. And Shikoku cope with that demand with uh, sending the electricity to Kansai. Because Shikoku and the Kansai are deeply connect each other. So uh, if Without the idea of flexibility, we, we already cope with 80% of the, the, the renewable supply. We need to change the, the paradigm. That's more important things. More questions? Yes. <laughs> The, the small-scale uh, uh, power generation is, of course, uh, very important because of the grid constraints. And the grid constraints in Japan are, are very much political. I mean, there is no political will uh, to get rid of the grid constraints. So uh, th there are two or three questions related to that. First of all, uh, the old term base load obviously loses its importance. Can you explain that a bit? Uh, the, the second question is, if you have all these small uh, uh, local produ producers, how important is the grid then at the, at the end? And, and the third, what about the intelligent grid? We have uh, a team here, I think with uh, Fujitsu, I don't remember, who actually works on, on a smart grid that works like the internet, where everybody can access as much as they want, but they have to go test in the States because it's not possible in Japan. Oh, what's the second point, is that you say? Uh, <laughs> the political grid constraints, yeah. and how, how important is the grid anymore, if you have all the local... Ah, OK, OK, OK. Yeah. If every village produces by itself. So, uh, uh, OK, I will take first on the... the hmm? What's, what's up? Yes. I, I, 
Oh yeah, base road. Base road is uh, rapidly the disappearing the idea, especially the like uh, Germany or Denmark or the more higher, the very intermittent, the renewable like solar and wind are uh, higher share more more than twenty percent. So uh, that means like uh, the solar and wind must be more flexible base road, and then the other the power, like uh, even the nuclear, the France and Germany and Spain, they are fluctuating nuclear power the, in order to back up in the, uh, or filling the gap of the, the demand and the fluctuating the solar and wind. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the more sharp, uh, like a, we, uh, the hydro or the gas uh, can fill it. Feel it, and also the demand, even the, the demand can be changed. And also the, the most important role is uh, the market. The market is more important to filling the gap. So, so no base road can be found in the, or most of the country of the higher share of the intermittent of the electricity. So, so uh, that is the now are on, on happening the reality. The, then, then, uh, then going towards those development, but I, I don't think uh, I, I maybe that it, it's a mixture. Like right? solar is getting cheaper and cheaper, and distributed the battery is also getting cheaper and cheaper, and people are more and more uh, apart from the the main grid, and the grid are uh, in a longer run the a kind of uh, the battery. The stranded asset, and the, but uh, still are the already the existing grid can be used for of the the base a kind of base uh, like a current, <laughs> so it's a mixture of uh, independency and the uh, kind of an uh, internet of the, uh, but more and more the big the in, in investment is not becoming more less necessary and necessary and and also and there are also, also like a professor Abe-san of Tokyo universities uh, he proposed that like an internet grid uh, those kind of idea can be also the becoming a uh, reality a uh, little by little and also also the supply side the also com com combination of the solar PV or wind with a battery can be uh, almost 24 hours stable supplying. It's also becoming uh, stable because uh, solar PV last five years are uh, getting cheaper, uh, one fifth. And uh, the battery is also becoming cheaper, one fourth. So it is more becoming uh, cheaper and cheaper. And those are both the uh, we can use the both the demand side or also the supply side. So uh, one 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 idea is come up with uh, actually is uh, now trying only a 50 kilowatt solar PV uh, because solar f 50 kilowatt is uh, the almost no control in a Japanese grid system. Uh, it's a so low level electricity, and the the solar PV can be installed 500 kilowatt. And in, in between the battery, and then uh, 20, 50 kilo, uh, users, the capacity factor of solar PV is uh, 12 percent. But the, if install the battery with 500 kilowatt solar PV, is a uh, hundred percent capacity factors all the night, 24 hours supplying. So this is uh, now becoming the reality of the supply side. So. Now are very the technology development is very exciting time. So uh, the happening new things. My name is Kurt Heinz. Uh, I'm an associate member and uh, working for a company that makes uh, assessment of renewable energy facilities, photovoltaic, wind, etc. So my question is. Uh, According to your data, and so I have also uh, researched on, uh, United States has about 80 gigawatts of installed wind power. Uh, uh, China, 
160 gigawatts, Germany about uh, 45 to 50 gigawatts of installed wind power, Japan has three. <laughs> so this means Japan has no wind. This is a country without wind. So what is the reason for this huge difference between high-tech countries uh, that uh, utilize wind energy? Thank you. Maybe you first, and I'll <laughs> follow. <laughs> um, it's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, there, there is a, or has been a scarcity of land available uh, for wind power in, in Japan. Um, when you talk about national forests or uh, prime agricultural land um, in the U.S., you know, for many many years, it's been seen as a great complement to agriculture. The farmers loved it. Um, the local communities loved it. Um, farmers got new access roads; so they could move their crops more easily. They were very happy about it. Um, so the ability to, to uh, have that symbiotic relationship with, with, with farmers has been a long time standing in the, in the U.S. and other places around the world, and just not, not in Japan. That has changed. Uh, our project that we're hopefully going to be starting construction with very shortly is on prime agricultural land um, that required a rezoning from uh, 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 agricultural use um, so it's a big step forward uh, begin it but again it was the first I believe it was the first ever large-scale project done on since the law has been amended to allow uh, wind farms on on agricultural land um. uh, my, my following up the uh, this is purely political structure reasons because uh, uh, one of my friends of political scientists in Norway uh, he 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 actually investigated the uh, uh, currently solar is cheaper <coughs> than wind, but only a few years before solar is so expensive than wind. But the Japan is only only so market based countries in uh, the wind is small smaller amount instru instru installation than wind uh, than solar in spite of the wind is cheaper but solar is expensive but Japan is only country that's this is political reason actually because uh, that's as a historical historical looking the solar PV was produced by the, the government expenditure uh, R&D and the METI is a government the few the solar is their child but wind is not their child. <laughs> wind is a kind of outsider from the governmental point of view. And especially they, they fail the development of the large scale wind uh, throughout the 80, uh, 1980s development. They once give, gave up the development the large scale. And in spite of the Mitsubishi had a very ex excellent wind power development during 80, 80s and they mm. export to California, it, but within the Mitsubishi, the nuclear is a, the centers. Wind is marginal, so as a, as a result, Mitsubishi all, almost sells their wind division in Denmark right now. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, and then then the, from electricity monopoly point of view, they are wind power is purely the enemy or outsider. But solar PV is, uh, at the beginning, they are only installed in uh, the household. And the household, the solar PV is a tool for promoting, so all electrifying the, the uh, house. And the, they are competing the gas company. So they are eliminating gas mm -hmm. company using solar PV to enclose the the household as a customer. So actually, Alexis Monopoly, they are not so the like the, the, the solar PV, but, uh, but still they are kind of insider of the Alexis Monopoly. So both the big player of the government, METI, and the uh, Alexis Monopoly, the <coughs> solar PV is a kind of insider but the wind power is outsider. So all the, all the other details were 
those political structures setting. So uh, uh, I have a lot of the episode <laughs> coming from those structure, but uh, it's a, there are no time. But uh, basically, this political structure create this very the, the unbalanced market structures were built in Japan. Yeah. And let me add, I think that there hasn't been a history of independent power production in Japan. We have in the United States from 1978, PURPA, um, when that was first instituted. And, and so you had, out, as he was saying, you had outsiders, you had private capital, you had people who were willing to take risks. And uh, um, I think that was what drew, drove uh, uh, renewable energy as much as true independent uh, other forms of, of of generation in the United States. Um, and that's just been lacking here in, here in Japan, and that's why the grid is not flexible. It's, uh, um, it's, uh, it's a big Thank part you. of it. Yeah. We reached the time, but I would like just to wrap up from uh, each of you. What, I what is the challenge, main challenge facing the alternative energy and uh, in Japan, basically? And uh, what do you expect, like the ratio of the alternative energy mix in the total power uh, production and energy production, not only electric power, is expected to be like within five years or ten years? Just very brief uh, question. Thank you. Each of you, please. Uh, okay, C coming five, ten years, uh, maybe. Uh, Japan should and also um, will uh, increase uh, much more than uh, the uh, increase the renewable share much more than expectations of the government. So, so that uh, is coming from more like uh, more independent uh, distributed power. So, uh, the after the solar booming, the so the more and more people working on linear energy as feeling as the ownership. So, so those are changing the political atmosphere to uh, renewable can be more more reality and can be more the center role. So that is uh, the changing uh, also and the changing the paradigm of the renewable energy uh, <coughs> from the marginal to the center. The coming ten, uh, coming five to ten, ten years. Uh, in Japan, we have very huge uh, geothermal potential, and uh, in the, until uh, 2030, uh, we will develop much more geothermal. Okay. Yeah, I guess um, you know the, the issues that that need to be. Uh, focused on first in Japan are access to the grid, modernization of the grid. Um, but additionally, you know, the Japanese government has done a good job on the, on the supply side, so they've provided in incentives for the generation side. Now they need to work towards freeing up the latent demand that, that's there. Um, and do they do that through uh, a renewable portfolio standard or through uh, this non-fossil uh, market that they want to establish? I think 44% by, I can't remember what year, but it's quite a ways in the future. Um, if, if those issues can get resolved, um, I think within a five-year period, development and construction is very slow in Japan, but I think within a five-year, five to ten-year period, you could easily see intermittent renewables uh, get to uh, at least 20 percent, so all in with, with uh, hydro at 30 um, should be very easily, e easily manageable on the grid here. Well, thank you very much. This wraps up our event. I would like to give you one honorary membership to our club. Uh, please come anytime, especially you are near in Tokyo. This is Mr. Ida, and this is Mr. Ihara, and Mr. Anderson. Right. Thank you for coming to the club and speaking today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.